gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's memorial presentation commemorating the lives of the Ludlow Miners. I ask that you please turn off your cell phones and use no flash photography during the presentation itself. Mount Carmel is proud to be part of this memorial week which honors the sacrifices, hardships, and bravery of those who lived and died in Ludlow. The first part of tonight's performance will be a lecture and dramatic interpretation of certain events and conditions that existed during the time when the Ludlow massacre occurred. Our guest lecturer is a Trinidad native and educator, Mr. Silvio Caputo. Mr. Caputo has given many lectures on Ludlow to historical and other societies throughout the state. His wife, Rosalie, will assist him in tonight's performance. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Mr. Silvio Caputo and Mrs. Rosalie Caputo. My name is Vincenzo Capullo. I was born in Isle of Calabro on October 8, 1889. I was married to Carmina, Daniele Pucci, in, 19, in 1908, in Grimaldi. I came to America on February 19, 1909, on the boat to Conagon Louise. We, leave, we got coming to America with my brothers. One to go to San Francisco, one to go to Salt Lake City, and one go to Denver, Colorado. I worked for a while in New York City. Then I come here. Everything I had in the world was in this room. My wife, she no come with me. I had to earn some money to send for her to bring her to the country. I worked for a while in the coca dell at the coke ovens. I had to get so hot at the coke ovens sometimes. We take the bread and put it in the front of the door and make it the toast. <laughs> when Carmina arrived, I picked her up in a wagon at the train station. She wanted to see the town, so we go up a commercial street. When we stopped, she got out of the wagon and looked around. It had rained, and the streets were mud. She started to cry. She said that the streets, they no paid. She says, I left a beautiful town to come here, and now it's all mud. I try to tell her it's not so bad. But it's a long way from home, and there's a no going back. <laughs> we left the town, and I take her to visit with the Frank and Mariette and Nakarata down here on Rosenberg. They live in a nice house in the town. And we stop in a visit. They're from the same Provenza, and so Carmina enjoy visiting. She fixes a nice meal, and we eat and we drink a wine, and the Frank can drink a beer. He likes the beer. After the while, after we visit, we, she decided to stay. After Carmina, 
came to America, we moved to Segundo. We're working in the coal mine. Segundo is a camp near the mine. Men and women come from all over the world to work in the mines, in the camps, so they speak 27 different languages. Some of them I can understand, some are not so much. We've got a company house in the camp where they speak in the same language to make the Carmina feel a little more comfortable. All of them would talk back home. But I tell her, there is no back home. <laughs> we come here, we have a work. Here is where we're going to make our lives. When you leave the campus, sometimes you hear five or six different languages at the same time. It was confusing. And you wonder, what are they saying? But when you work it down into the mine, you come it together and you learn to understand that Everybody is pretty much saying the same thing. Because of the mind is a very dangerous if you can't communicate with each other. <coughs> this camp is a much different from where you come from. Everything you know is no good here. All of the traditions are different. The food, the clothes, how they do things. But there is too much work to be done we must make a living. Sometimes we look at each other like, I want to trust you. <laughs> but little by little, it is, well, these people are not so bad. My wife says sometimes that that's not how we do things. But I say, you're no home no more. You're here. <laughs> In the mind, we learn to all the talk so that we can understand and into the camp, you must do the same thing. It is better to make your home here. But in the camp, it is no easy. The coal camps are all isolated up at the canyon. Some camps are surrounded by the barbed wire, and they have a guard at the entrance. Everything in the camp, your house, the church, the store, where you buy what you need, the school, the saloon, everything is owned by the company. Some men put together little crates and little scrap irons to make it their house. But this is no good. When it rains, the water comes in and everything gets wet. We rent a house. It's a company house, and you pay a two dollars a room per month. Out of the back of the house, they have a few boards with a gunny sack to tack it together with a hole in the ground. You go there to do your business. <laughs> they call it the back of house. <laughs> yes, because it's in the back of the house. <laughs> It's a pretty damn cold there in the back of the house in the wind. <laughs> and in the summer, you got to be real careful because of the black and widow spiders that make the nest on the seat. And if they bite you, it stings something terrible. <laughs> Some of these are back of the house that have a little shack over, and it gives you a little privacy. For the water into the camp, they pump in front of the Purgatory River into like a little pond, but it's no good. There's too much mud and too much cola dust. You try to throw in a little bit of alum to make it all set, but it's still no good. In 1912, 157 people got sick from the typhoid because of the water was bad. I'll tell you a little story about the, how important the water was. One time, I see a young boy, a small boy. His name was Joey Bonacuista. And his mama sent him up to the well by the mine to get the water. And she put the buckets inside of the little wooden cart. 
and the cart was a pool to buy the donkey. And the little boy went up to the hill to the well, and he filled with the buckets. And he was on his way home to bring the water to his family. And the mine guard saw him, and he says, Where the hell do you think you're going with that water? And the little boy was scared. He couldn't say nothing. And the mine guard went over to the little boy, and he took the water, and he threw him on the ground. Then he took his boot, and he smashed the wagon. And he kicked the little donkey. And the little boy, he ran home and he was crying. He felt bad. That's the kind of summer I bet you you have sometimes. He's a bartender again. <laughs> Into the camp, you buy what do you need out of the company store. The food, the clothes, the furniture. You pay the price. Sometimes the company pay you in a script, and it's the only place you can spend. It's not a lack of the money. You've got to spend that at the company store. You could buy credit, but then you owe the company money, and they think that they own you. This is the life of Ron my Carmina in America. And now she's going to tell you about what she found. I soon learned what it was like to live in a disacola camp. Every morning in the kitchen, we have a bucket full of the water. But you know, during the night, it's so cold in our house, it's all ice. I have to take this water for the morning of breakfast, and I got to put it on the stove, or we don't have nothing to wash our hands with. That's how cold it is inside of this house. <coughs> then I make a breakfast and I make a lunch. That's a Vincenzo's a lunch pill right there. He's a got to take that into the mine. And he's got to eat a lot because of that work is a pretty hard for him. Then the children, they also need a lunch for school. <coughs> when a Vincenzo leave for work, I pray all the time because I want him to come back to me because there's a lot of men who are dying in those are mines. It's very dangerous. We have six children. Antonio, he's the oldest, and he's a very tall boy. One day, he come home from his school, and he asked me, Mama, I want to play a basketball. I said, Tony, what is this a basketball? He said, Mama, I got to play with the other boys, and I got to stay after your school. I said, Tony, you know what can I do because we got to the goats, and you got to know that those are goats after your school. So, Tony, no can to play. But the next day, he had come back home, and he's a guy, he's a coach. And there's another boy with him called a Betty. Well, coach, you tell me, Mr. Cahuto. Then he can of milk with the goats. I take a Tony. He come and play with the team. <laughs> I never tell a Vincenzo this. I'm sorry, honey, but <laughs> I wanted my boy to be like the, the other kids, and I think it's a good that he plays a basketball. And I bet he learned how to milk with the goat, so it's okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> my second son is called Silvio. He's such a nice boy. When he was only five years old, he goes into Ringo's store in Segundo, and he goes into that store, and he's only five years old, he's a little boy, but they tell him he can get to work, he can stock the shops because they're low. So there my little Silvio, he starts working when he's five years old, and I have to tell you this, when he go to high school, he become a valedictorian of a Primero High School. I'm very proud of that boy. My third son is a Pasquale. And I love him too. I have three girls, Francesca, Maria, and Paulino. And they're all the nice kids. I have to tell you something really bad though. My oldest boy is Emilio, and he died during the, the typhoid when he came to town. Because the water, it's really bad. 
bad. And he killed a lot of the children. This is very bad. And you know, every morning I wake up and I think maybe I'm going to see Emilio, but uh, I'm not going to see him anymore. Well, I still think about him every day. But every autumn, you know, there's a lot of pinions and there's a lot of pine trees in these hills here in Trinidad. I take all the children, and they think it's a fun, and they think it's a play. But we go in the hills, and we take the pine cone, and inside of the pine cone, there's these, these pinoles. And we take the pine nuts, and we, we sack them in a little bag. And I take some of them to a rainbow store, and I get sugar, and I get a lot of stuff for the house. And the children think that they're having fun. <laughs> We have a lot of animals too. We got the chickens, then we got the goats. We heard about the goats before in the milk, and we make a good goat and cheese with the bad goat milk. Then we got our rabbits. The bad thing about the rabbits is I have to always tell the children they're not a pet. One a day. We're gonna have a dad a rabbit for dinner. And you can't have not love that rabbit. <laughs> and then we kill the pig. The men do that. But then we all help make a nice sausage, sausage and it's good for the whole year. The thing I like the best is that when we get to leave all the children out of home, and me out of the other women, we go downtown to Trinidad. That's a really a nice day. And we take a turn, sometimes I have to take care of all of the children. But this is a really nice, I love it going downtown with that in Trinidad. I look in all of the stores and I see all of the nice things. Things are kind of expensive, so I don't buy very much. But the thing I like the best is that before we go home, we go in the Hosman's and drug store. And there I buy ice cream or soapy pop. I just love with that. It's a good day. <laughs> Then you fry it, and then you put that a nice honey on it. 
that's really nice. Another thing is that we could do is I help the children with their homework because I wanted them to be a really smart. And the education, it's a really important to me. I'm no good at the English, but I can help them. And the children, they're teaching me how to speak. I speak English so good now because of my children, they are teaching me. <laughs> oh, the thing I don't like is a dirty house. See all of this coal? It's all over. Vincenzo, he come home and he's got it from his head down to his toe in a coal dust. I tell him he no touch nothing with that coal all over him. So I get the hot water and I put it that a big tub in the side of the kitchen and I scrub him down with the lye soap. <laughs> <laughs> that water, it's a dirty when he gets out of there. <laughs> now you know, we had married in a 1908 in a Grimaldi, Italy. But we don't have a, no money and we don't have got a, no jobs. So Vincenzo think he's gonna come to the United States of America and he's gonna make money. I stay back in Italy. But then uh, World War II, World War I it comes. And you know what? I can't not come here. I wait a long, a long, a long time. And some times I think maybe he forget about the thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> finally, it didn't take a long time. But finally, I get it to go. But then, that day, it was the saddest day of my life. When I got on a that esteem a ship, I think I believe in my mama and a my dad. How can I leave in my family? I don't know. I might have never, never give it back. But I was enough because of my brother, he comes with me. So I get to have him with me for many years here in the Trinidad. But he lucky. He got to go back to home. And he saved a lot of money, and they helped my whole family back in Italy because he saved the money because we lost a lot of land in the Battle of War. Well, Vincenzo, I have to tell you this. When I was in Italy, I missed you. <laughs> And then now that I'm with the him, I really miss the Italy. <laughs> I went over with 
my shovel to see what happened. And the wall had to come down onto the two men in the next room. So I took my shovel and I started to dig to try to find, to see if we could get to them before they did. Some of the other miners said, they come and they help. We all dig. But while we dig, the boss show up. And he says, what the hell happened? Mom, he's stupid. <laughs> what the hell happened? The wall came down. <laughs> we continue to dig. And this boss, he says, they must have been a careless. I knew these two men, and they're no careless. They're good minds. I know why he says they was a careless. Because if the company proves you was a careless, there's no compensation to your family for your debt. If they prove the man with you was a careless, there's no compensation for your death or to your family. You have to prove the company's fault. But how the hell are you going to prove the company's fault? It's all under the call. It's a barrier. They have a jury. There were no minors on the jury. Uh, hey, Vincent, tell them about the explosion. Oh, the explosion. Explosion. Into the mine, or when you dig it with the pick, the coal dust that goes into the air. Sometimes it gets so thick you can barely see. When the coal cart, Leaves of the room, it crushes the coal onto the tracks and the dust comes into the air. The company says the coal, the dust, the don't explode, but we know that the coal dust explodes. The coal in the mine produces a methane the gas. With this slab, you check to see if it's the same. They put them the fans into the mine, but the fans are going to work it so good. So you have the coal dust and the methane where it works. Sometimes they can explode. No, no, I tell you, I tell you what, what explosion in a mine is. An explosion in a mine is the devil that are coming from a hell and works with you into that room. He's in there with you every day. And somebody make a mistake, and then he brings the fire from hell, and you get explosion. That's explosion in the mind. Yeah. It's going to kill you and everybody there, too. That is explosion. I remember Primero exploded twice. The lava exploded. Starkville explode, Tertio explode, and many, many more explode. But the worst explosion was at the Hastings. In 1917, 120 men who were in that mine who in the Sheik explode. Some people say there were more men, and they never take them out of that mine. Hastings became like a graveyard. That was an explosion in the mine. When we hear that explosion, we are run. We are dropping everything of that, and we doing it. We are running to that mouth of the mine. And then we sit and we wait and we pray and nobody says a word because we watch. <coughs> then you hear that a bell coming. That a bell means that they're bringing some of the men back out of the mine. Sometimes when you see those men, you don't even know if that's your husband. He's all burnt. You cannot even tell who he is. You've got to look at him. He has a brass and check. You've got to read a number. See who he is. Then it all starts. Then we cry. And then we pray. And then we become.
in 19 and 13, and I said, ah, the miners are feeling they're not going to take it no more. There was a group, AM and the coal camps, the call of the UM and the WA, the United Mining Workers of America. They say they're going to get you better pay. They say they're going to get you pay for the dead of work. They say they're going to make the miners safe. They say they're going to make it so that you can shop and buy things any place you want. And they say they're going to make the company obey the laws of the state of Colorado. <coughs> Sounds pretty good. And it's on the September 23rd, 1913, we went on a strike. It was a bad day. All the summer long, it was a hot and a dry, and the earth began to crack. But on that day, it started to rain. And it rained, and it rained, and the canyons were filled with the like of little rivers, and there was all mud. When you go on a strike, you've got to get off of the company of property because they own everything. If you don't, they come and take everything that you have and throw them in the mud. We bring the wagon and put everything on the wagon and start it down in the canyon. But the horse can't pull the wagon because he's getting stuck. So we get out of the wagon and we push. I push. Got me and pushes. The children push. Little by little, we get down to Tulapo. There, John Lawson is there. He's there to put up the tents so that we can live. Everybody there is cold. Everybody there is hungry and wet and covered in mud. It was a long, a hard time. Some of the miners, they no go on a strike. The other miners are calling the scabs and many other bad things. And we believed the end of the camp that there was going to be a war. There was a group at the end of the camp. They were the Greeks. And their leader was Louis Tikus. They were good men with the guns. They had the experience of in the war from Greece. And while we were trying to set up the camp, they protected them. Then one day, a woman came into the camp. Her name was Mary Harris Jones. They called her a Mother Jones. The company was afraid of this woman. She never carried a gun, but she spoke with a fire. And when the men and the women heard her, they had a fire in them too. But let Carmina know, <coughs> what is she telling you? Let me tell you about a mother of Jones. She come into town in one a day, and she stay at the Tolteca Hotel. She spent the night in there, but in the next morning, this is General Chase. He had taken her right out of breakfast, and he had taken her to jail. You know where they have the jail? At a Mount St. Rockville Hospital. They make it that a prison. Well, we and women, we hear about that, and we said, we're going to go in and get a mother at Jones, and we're going to make her free. So, we had take all the women, and we have to take the children with us. We had started walking it down to the streets of Trinidad. It's kind of like a parade. We're all there with all of the women and all the children. Right around the post office, we see that a general at Chase, he's on his horse. That a man is so mean. He had taken his foot, he tries to kick at the women. Well, he's also a stupid. <laughs> he falls off of his horse. <laughs> we laugh too, because he looks like a fool. Well, he get back on that horse of his, and then he tells all of his 
they take some of the women and they put those women in a jail with the mother jokes. Next day, the paper in Trinidad, it write up about what happened. It is said that the cavalry and the general chase, he had run it down to the women with the children, thousands. Well, that made news in all of the United States of America. Now everybody knows what happened in here, in those streets of Trinidad, and everybody knows how bad it's here in Colorado. Ah, then the winter came. Oh, it was a bad winter. It just snowed and it snowed and it snowed. There was a ten feet between the tents. Everything out the side was frozen. Sometimes at the night, the company show the lights over the tents so that you can not sleep. Sometimes they shoot the bullets through the tents. So we dig a holes beneath, beneath the tent like a cellar, so that you can hide when the bullets are coming through. All went along and there was a tension because nobody trusted anybody. Everybody waited for that want to come. Everybody hiding the rifles. Everybody had back in a port with the company. They came up with something called the Death Special. In the Death Special, they take a machine gun and they put it into the car. And around the car, they put the steel. You can't shoot the men into the car. And they used that weapon at the camp in Forbes. And they destroyed Forbes. Everybody was worried what was going to happen next. In April of 1914, the spring had come. Everybody was hopeful. The militia was supposed to leave the camps. At a level, they had a celebration for Easter. And they had a baseball game. During the baseball game, some of the militia show up. And they say, you have your fun today. Tomorrow we have our roast. But we don't worry too much, because they always make threats. The next morning, they called the Lord Ticus into the office. And they said, you have a man being held at the level against his will. His name is Tutomando. And he said, no, he doesn't know in the camp. But he knows that they want to get into the camp to check it to see where the guns are. Then things began to happen real fast. The company moved with a machine gun to Water Tank Hill. The men at Ludlow C, they think they're going to attack. The men in the camp will start to scramble for their guns. And the men on the water tank the hill will think the men in London are going to attack. Then explosions went up of the cannon. And somebody think that the war has started and everybody started to shoot. <coughs> to protect themselves, the women began to hide. Some hide into the cannon. Some are hiding down the well, and some are hiding into the pits beneath the tents. All day long there was a shooting back and forth. Some people got killed. Then before it got dark, the train arrived, and it made a wall between the tents and the water tank hill. People from the level began to flee into the hills. They're trying to get out of the colony because they know the attack is coming. The militia went between the train cars and they started to set fire to the tents. 
Some of the men that stayed behind, Louis Tinkus, who was a one, but the militia find him and they bring him to a lieutenant to Linda Felton. And they argue whose fault it was. And the lieutenant to Linda Felton hit the lawyer with the butt of his gun. And he falls down into a pool of blood. And while he's on the ground, they shoot him. And the tents are burned in the night. In the dark black of the night, the tents were burning. I have a hard time of talking about this part because of Mary Petrucci, she wasn't my friend. Mary Petrucci, she went in and to that a hospital tent that a night with the, her three children because she thought the hospital tent would have been a safe to tent number 58. She was there with the two other women and their children and two. They think uh, the flame is not going to harm them because they're inside in the pit. Well, they never <coughs> get burnt, but they can not escape without a smoke. That smoke, it went down into the pit, and it all got them unconscious. Next morning, Mary, she awake up. <coughs> she tried to wake up her children, but they're all dead. Everybody in that tent, they died. Mary's the only one who didn't die. She got up out of that tent. She looked out aside. She sees a light blow. And it's nothing there. It's all burnt. She looked back into the pit, and she sees how they died. And that's a lot low. Vincenzo Caputo died in 1975. He was diagnosed with black lung disease years before his death, carrying the coal within him to his grave. 